My title today is, Oh God, Do Something. Now maybe if you're in a crisis or facing a problem, that is the cry of your heart. And I believe that this teaching is going to help you. Day after day when Jesus was on the earth, he demonstrated the authority and the power in helping people who were in crisis situations. Read this in any gospel. He calmly stilled the storm, fed the multitudes, cast out demons, healed the sick and even raised the dead. The disciples in the sinking ship, remember, shouted out to him, woke him up and said, Master, don't you care that we perish? Blind Bartimaeus shouted to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Both these examples in Mark 4 and in Mark 10 people crying out and saying, Lord, do something for us. Now, when the storms of life hit us, it's our natural reaction to call out to God, to cry in a similar way. Don't you care? I'm sick. I'm broke. I'm depressed. I'm dying. Oh God, do something. But we have to realise there's a big difference between the time of Jesus and our time. Because between his life on earth and our time, an immensely important event took place. God did something. Jesus was born. He was raised as a child. He started his ministry at 30. He had three and a half years of ministry. And then he died. He was crucified. God answered mankind's problems with the death of Christ on the cross. He shed his blood, the blood of the new covenant, the covenant based upon better promises. Now when God raised Jesus from the dead, that resurrection power was also poured out upon the 120 believers at Pentecost. 50 days after the crucifixion, those believers were gathered at Jerusalem waiting for the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now amongst those 120 believers were 11 apostles. Judas had betrayed Jesus, remember. And so the apostles decided to replace Judas and they cast lots and Matthias was chosen. But that was man's choice. God's choice was the highly educated Saul of Tarsus. On the Damascus road, this man was confronted by the risen Christ. He was blinded by that great light that shone from heaven. He fell off his horse and he was helped by Ananias, who was a disciple Jesus sent Ananias to him and Ananias prayed for him that he would receive his sight. And Ananias was told that this man was a chosen vessel to go to the Gentiles. Saul became known as the Apostle Paul. He went on three missionary journeys preaching the gospel of grace. Many places he visited, including Ephesus. He spent three and a half years at Ephesus. We read in Acts 20 that he left Ephesus. And after his departure from that city, he left the church in charge of his spiritual son, Timothy. Now, why am I telling you all this? Paul established the church at Ephesus. And later he wrote the epistle to the Ephesians. And in that epistle... Paul explained that the stewardship of God's grace was entrusted to me to dispense to you for your benefit. And the mystery or secret was made known to me by direct revelation, the insight into the mystery of Christ. God had chosen Paul to show him the eternal mystery of grace. For both Jew and Gentile. And it was 
Paul's job, the Apostle Paul's job, to dispense it. If you go to a chemist, a chemist dispenses medicine. He makes up the medicine and then he dispenses it or gives it, you have to pay of course, to the people in need. So there's a dispensing of medicines. Paul was a dispenser of God's grace. Now, in the epistle to the Ephesians, we see how Paul dispensed that grace. He declared to us in chapter 1 that God has already blessed us in verse 3. He's already empowered us to prosper. He has chosen us before the foundation of the world. That's verse 4. He's adopted us into his family. That's verse 5. He's made us accepted in the beloved. That's verse 6. Accepted there means highly favoured. That's the Greek meaning. He's given us redemption or the forgiveness of sins. That's in verse 7. We have obtained an inheritance in verse 11. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit in verse 13. And the resurrection power of God, the raising from the dead power, has been given to us in verse 19 and 20. All of this is in the past tense. Well, if all of this is available to us, where is it? God has placed all of this in our born-again spirit. And Paul prayed in verse 18 of that first chapter... He prayed that the eyes of our understanding would be opened in order that we'd realise this. You see, we cannot feel our spirit. We can't tell what's there. Just like I can't tell if my hair is combed. I need a mirror. And if we want to know the condition of our born-again spirit and what's in our born-again spirit, what benefits have already been placed there, we need to look in a mirror, the mirror of God's word, as James 1 tells us. So if we're facing a crisis, let's go back now to that situation. If we're facing a crisis, we need to change our perspective. We should not pray if we're sick, oh God, heal me. The word of God says, by his stripes you were healed, 1 Peter 2.24. If you're broke and need a financial miracle, you've no need to cry out to God, oh God, do something. Instead, realise that God has already provided all things necessary for our life and godliness. They are in our born again spirit. Now, you probably realise you can't see on this video, but you probably know that in my breath, there is water vapour, but you cannot see it. I would need a cold surface. If I breathed on a cold surface, what was in my breath or in my spirit would manifest into the physical realm so you could see it. All of these benefits God has provided by grace and he's placed them in our born again spirit. They're all there for us. There's enough healing power there. There's enough wealth there. He generated all that 2,000 years ago and he made a deposit in our born again spirit. When we were born again, we received all those benefits. Now, how do we access them? Well, Jesus spoke of our spirit as being like a well. You have to draw out from that well. And how do we draw out What's in our born-again spirit? We do it by faith. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. That's Romans 5 and verse 2. We need to say, Lord, I believe it and I receive it. Faith is the appropriate response to what God has already provided by his grace. Now, most Christians do not have this mindset. Most Christians are thinking that by fasting and prayer, tithing and doing all sorts of good works, 
that eventually God will unfold his arms and come through with their miracle. But the truth is God has already come through. He's already moved. He's already done something. He has provided by grace everything that you need. It's there in our born again spirits for us to draw out into the physical realm by faith. Faith abounds with thanksgiving. We can only be thankful if we know that God has already done something. I said to my wife last night, I said, could you pass me my Bible? She passed me my Bible. I said, thank you. I received and therefore I said, thank you. We only say thank you when we've received something. So we can abound in thanksgiving knowing we've already received. It's very difficult to be thankful if we're trying to persuade God, who we picture as being stubborn, trying to persuade him to move. We don't need to do that. God has already moved. So take on this new perspective. You've no need to beg God and try and make him do something for you. He's already done it by his grace and by faith we receive it and we're thankful to him. God bless you. Thanks for listening.